Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you might be, whatever it might be. Welcome to the Tadwig 2021 working sessions. This one is entitled ITG02, the Darwin Core Maintenance Interest Group. And I'm your moderator, John Vichorek, who is the convener of the Darwin Core Maintenance Interest Group. I am an information architect for VertNet, and I'm coming to you from Bariloche, Argentina. My co-moderators are Steve Baskoff from Vanderbilt in the US, and Tim Robertson from GBIF in Denmark. And we're grateful for support from Holly Little in the US and from Paolo Sermoglio in Argentina. And we also have with us our other maintenance group core members, Peter Besmet and David Bloom, and if he's here already, Marcus Julian. The session is going to be recorded for later viewing, so keep that in mind and conduct yourselves accordingly. Um, thank you for joining the session. The format is going to consist of a fairly short introduction to the Darwin Core Standard, so that everyone knows what we're talking about, and we welcome newcomers. Um, if you are a newcomer, that is, if you haven't been to a TABIG meeting before, could you please put an exclamation mark next to your name in the chat? And after we do this introduction, there's going to be an open time for questions. And then there's going to be a working session in which we're going to deal with three different sets of pending issues of the standard. In that part, we're going to separate into three different rooms. We'll also keep the main room open for people who don't feel confident to contribute or rather that they have more questions to ask than were covered already in the questions and answers period following the introduction. You can ask questions in the chat while presenting anytime. And we'll also capture them in the shared document. You'll find the link to the shared document in the chat. So if you're comfortable with adding uh, content to that Google Doc, that might be a preferred place to have the chat come through, but it's fine also to put it into the Zoom chat. The chat function has been made available for technical questions or for conversing with other attendees. Please use it judiciously as any nefarious or inappropriate use of that chat may result in you being removed from the session or of the chat being closed entirely. Please see the code of conduct document that should be linked in the chat for more information about that. Also, you've entered the room with your microphone muted by default. And if you could please leave it that way until uh, we ask for open questions. And even then, if you could use the function to raise your hand so that we can call upon you to try to keep order because we have a lot of people attending today. Thank you. With that, I'll begin to go through the introduction to the Darwin Core Maintenance Interest Group. As I said before, I'm your convener. And you can contact me at the email address on the slide. The other core members who you can also contact are listed in the lower right of the front slide. The collaborative notes can be found. You'll see this in the chat as well, but just for clarity and for posterity, the link to the collaborative notes for this session can be found at that URL. I'll leave that there for just a few seconds more in case you want to copy it, but you should be able to find it and copy it in the chat. Okay, so there are four basic topics that I'd like to cover today. They include something about what interest groups and task groups, how they function. Then specifically, what is this Darwin Core maintenance interest group all about? Then I'll talk about what we've been doing lately and a little bit about what we're in progress to do this interest group. And then finally, 
go into a little bit of detail about how to get involved in the group if that interests you. After that, we'll have the questions, like I said, and after that, we'll see if we can get some work done collaboratively. So the interest groups and task groups in TABRIG are meant to develop and maintain biodiversity information standards, simple as that. They provide the basis for discussion, discussion of problems and goals and strategies, and the methods and applications of generic technologies to achieve those goals. So the interest groups are kind of general and, and persist as long as the interest persists. And the interest groups can spawn task groups. And task groups do things. So in a limited time period, they do what they're supposed to do and then they get closed. Or they don't do what they're supposed to do and because of that, they get closed. In any case, they're ephemeral and they maintain the products. Uh, the interest group maintains the products of the past task groups. So, what happens after a standard is ratified? An interest group might create a task group that says, we're going to create a standard. And it goes through a process to create that standard. But what we're gonna talk about now is what happens after that, because that's what this maintenance group is all about. So the task group that created the standard disappears because it did its job and a new interest group is spawned. And the interest group is based directly around the standard that was just created. So it's there now to oversee and maintain what was produced. I'm not gonna go through the details of the process over there on the right, but it's for your edification. So an interest group then creates task groups and this could be the, uh, any interest group. The task groups develop things in this case a standard and then after that's done the maintenance interest group is created to keep it going and keep it vibrant and alive and relevant so once that maintenance interest group is created because it's an interest group like others it can also spawn tasks to do things to maintain the standard so one of those could be to uh, execute changes that have been called upon by the community People decide that uh, Darwin Core doesn't do enough. They have an idea of something it could do or do better. A task group, this is one option, a task group can be created if it's an uh, in-depth and complex thing that the community needs to come to some consensus about. And that task group answers to the maintenance group. It could be that a task group that calls for change to Darwin Core is actually instantiated under a different interest group, not the Darwin Core maintenance interest group, because its scope is broader than Darwin Core. So for example, currently there is a task group instantiated to create chronometric age vocabulary, a set of terms for chronometric age. Even though the original reason for creating that group was to make a chronometric age extension to Darwin Core, the work that it's doing, the terms that it is defining are relevant to any standard. And so it was created in the uh, paleontology interest group where its work will be done. And when it's finished, the paleontology interest group and the Darwin Core maintenance group will get together and uh, ensure that the implementation is taken care of after the fact. So, that's how, that's what the relationship is between the interest groups and the task groups, the creation of a standard and the maintenance of a standard. So a little bit of Darwin Core history, super briefly, Darwin Core came into existence under an interest group that was observations and specimens interest group. The initial works predate any of that in 1998, where a 20 term Darwin Core was made in order to do some early collaborative uh, uh, federated database queries. In 2002, along with the initial growth of GBIF and an early protocol for sharing data via something called the Distributed Information 
uh, distributed generic information retrieval protocol, the MANUS Mammal Information Network System and GBIF put together a version of Darwin Core that was much more rich in terms. And this uh, proceeded simultaneously with the development of ABCD. There were two different approaches to how to share biodiversity information. So much later, in around 2008, in a tent in Argentina, which I call the Darwin Core Retreat Center, I tried to formalize what had been in practice already for six years and to divorce it from the protocol that the data were being shared through to make what has become Darwin Core as a standard now. So that began late in 2008. And in early 2009 on Darwin Day, the, there was a launch of a community review of what was being proposed. Then in October, around the time of the Tadwig meetings, in 2009, the Darwin Core was ratified as a standard for the first time. And at that time, it looked very much like what you see today, though there have been some changes. So what is Darwin Core? Broadly speaking, it's a body of standard practice to facilitate the sharing of biodiversity data. And specifically, in terms of if you look at the page for Darwin Core Standard, what do you find? The thing that is the standard is a list of terms and their definitions for things that are commonly shared in biodiversity networks. And there are around 200 such terms. Slightly less, but since this slide is meant to persist a while and we're about to add some new ones, we can just put that a rough 200. So Darwin Core also has some principles behind it that guide how it's maintained and why it is the way it is. So briefly, those principles are listed here. Simplicity means that we want there to be a way without barrier for people without a lot of technical skill to still be able to share data, even if those data are dirty even if they're not up to uh, standards for most recent taxonomy, et cetera, et cetera. The reason being that at least you can share, then you can take advantage of the tools that help you to improve the data after the fact. So that's one reason why simplicity comes into play. Relevance comes into play because we don't want to just have one term for every possible biodiversity concept we can think of. We only want them there if we're committed to sharing information and doing something with it. So relevance comes in there. Clarity is kind of hand in hand with simplicity. We try to make the definitions clear. And here is something that's ongoing and that can be helped by the community at all times because clarity always depends on the perspective of the holder. And as new communities of biodiversity data sharing come to the table, we find that some of the definitions that are there aren't so clear because they don't apply exactly or in the same way to a particular discipline. So the, the next one is consistency, where across the definitions of our terms, we try to make sure that we use similar language when we have the definitions and that we have similar recommendations when we do have recommendations, uh, and that the, as a whole, you kind of get a feeling for how to describe things and how to define things using Darwin Core. Stability is important and goes in ha hand in hand with both simplicity and relevance. The stability part is to be sure that we're not changing the Darwin core every week just because we have a great new idea. We want to make sure that when we make a change that it's solid, that we understand what it is supposed to do and what the sorry, ramifications of doing it are so that we don't break people's software week by week. And we've done pretty well with that. Um, there have been important changes to Darwin 2009, but not a lot of different ones. We're going to try to maintain that, uh, but probably more on the 
the scale of making changes once a year in bulk if we can. That's a goal. It's not, not a rule. It's something we're, we're going to try to do. Uh, as a complement to simplicity and hand in hand with relevance, we have the principle of extensibility. If the Darwin core can't do something that two communities would like, two or more communities would like it to do, because it's not important to, to expand the Darwin core just to share things with yourself. But if it's relevant to, to more than one community, the principle of extensibility says we can add things. That might be new terms to the Darwin core itself, or it could be that we create extensions that are meant to be used with the Darwin core, but aren't actually part of the standard. And re right now, we're getting into the realm of creating extensions themselves that are standards in their own right. And that uh, follows along with adaptability. We have the capacity to change the, def the, uh, the standard based on need, not only in the extensibility way, but also with the capacity to modify the terms, their definitions, their commentaries, and examples associated with them on an ongoing basis in a dynamic way and based on community demand. So adaptability is something where everyone, all of you, can participate. Another thing to say about adaptability, I think is coming in the following slide, and that is the Darwin Core Standard consists of normative parts, that is the law. This is really what Darwin Core says and there's and nothing more. And then there are the non-normative parts, which are the commentaries around that. So for those of you who are familiar with Darwin Core, but not with what has happened in the last couple of years with Darwin Core, one of the major changes was that we took the comments and examples out of the normative part of the standard and left only the identifiers, definitions, and a few other metadata items as the normative parts. The reason is that the comments and examples are the parts that change all the time. And in order to keep the stability of Darwin Core and without having to change uh, the, the entire standard because we want to add an example, we have those parts separated. Another thing that might surprise you, because most people who come to Darwin Core come to it through the quick reference guide, which is a, a human consumable document of the terms and their definitions, and hopefully an easy to use format, is an extraction of the normative Darwin Core and its commentaries and examples so that it's nice and easily usable. But Keep in mind that half of that document is not normative. So another thing that's important to distinguish because there's some confusion about this is that Darwin Core is not exactly equal to a Darwin Core archive. The Darwin Core archive is an implementation of one of the parts of the Darwin Core standard, which is the text guide explaining if you're going to share Darwin Core based information as text, do it in a way that is specified in the text guide. And the Darwin Core Archive is an implementation of that standard, that part of the Darwin Core standard. So my, <clears throat> uh, my co-host uh, and creator of this beautiful presentation tried to explain it in the following way. And I think this should be easy for just about anybody to consume, to show the differences. The data that we have, you can think of as the eggs. And when we put those eggs into an egg carton, we're putting them in some kind of order. And that is putting the information into the Darwin Core terms, the, into their slots. So that's data in Darwin Core. But the Darwin Core archive is taking it a step further. It's taking those data in order in their cartons and adding some other stuff to it like what is the relevance of the whole set of data in the carton or cartons and packing them all together in a way that can be shared so that's what a darwin core archive it's got metadata 
about data sets along with the data. And it can also have more than just Darwin Core in it. And then finally, in order to do something uh, scrumptious with the data, we have the combination of all the Darwin Core archives through aggregators or individually to do things with, to uh, put them to some purpose. So hopefully that clarifies the distinction between the Darwin Core as a standard and the part of it that helps people share the data. So now on to the Darwin Core maintenance group interest groups activities. Obviously it's to maintain the Darwin Core, both the normative parts and the non-normative parts. You might think that we really have no business doing the part that's not the standard, but in fact, in order to make the standard relevant, remember that principle, we also occupy ourselves with trying to keep the non-normative parts relevant. And all of that is to address the needs of the community. So one of the ways in which we do that is through an auxiliary activity called the Darwin Core Hour and a GitHub website that's called the Darwin Core Questions and Answers site. So the combination of these two is one for webinars periodically on topics relevant to Darwin Core that people request. And the other is kind of an ongoing place to submit your questions and hope that you can get relevant and timely answers about how to do things. And on the bottom of the screen right now, you can see a link to the Darwin Core Questions and Answers GitHub site. I'll leave it that for just a second, a couple of seconds. I think you should also be able to see that in the chat, although I'm not seeing the chat myself right now. Okay. So what have we been doing the last two years? Uh, people who have been following us may think that not much has happened in Darwin Core, but it's because what's happened has been a cleanup session for a couple of years even. So a few years ago, Darwin Core actually included within its own standard how that standard should be maintained. And we thought that was kind of silly, useful, but silly, because all of Tadwig needed this. So Steve Baskoff took on the Herculean project of creating two standards, both of which are listed on this page. One, the one on the bottom was how to create a standard within Tadwig. And then the one relevant to us right now is once you've got a standard, how do you maintain it? And so with Darwin Core, what we did was to extract those parts that were how to maintain Darwin Core and rely on this vocabulary maintenance specification for how to do things. That meant we had to recast Darwin Core as a standard and what it contained, what was normative and what was not. And then so over the last two years, we've been aligning with that and we've, I think, just recently achieved those goals. Which means that we're ready to do the normal business of a standard and a standards maintenance group, which is to adapt to requests for change. So right now, if you haven't already seen, we are nearing the end of a 30 day review period for a set of requested term additions and changes. And these have to do with some characteristics of events and occurrences and what it means it, uh, for, for example, invasive species and introduced species to say, how is the, the thing observed in the field got there? Pathway, for example. And there are also some proposals for controlled vocabularies for these new terms. So, one of our groups today is going to see all of these in it. That will be in the location and tent group. Keep that in mind if these are of particular interest, if you haven't reviewed these already and you want to, they're available in that group to still for discussion. So this is the kind of work that we do on an ongoing basis is to maintain, add and review requests for changes to terms. We do so, we track all of this work in GitHub using the GitHub issue tracker. So here's a bit of a screen capture showing what that looks like. Our current state, I think, is that we might have 78 open now, because this was actually captured yesterday. Maybe there's still 77, I haven't checked this morning. 
But the issues are uh, accepted from anyone via GitHub. And then the maintenance group reviews them for what they contain, how to categorize them. So you can see in the colored uh, tickets there that they're labeled. So that first one right now shows that it has one label where there's term change. It means somebody's requesting a change to a Darwin Core 10. And there are lots of different uh, labels, it's almost 40 of them, to help us to organize and to work on the issues as they come up. You'll see those when you go to rooms to work on things today. When you have a request for a change, we ask that those requests come in a particular format. It helps us to make sure that they're well thought out, complete, and have the information that we need to move them forward. To do so, there are there is an issue template for new terms that looks like this, and there's an issue template for a change to a term. And then finally, there's a different set that's not about term changes at all, but changes to documentation in the standard. If you go to the GitHub site to produce a new issue, you can actually select a template to start with and it'll fill up the, your comment with that information that needs to be filled in. So hopefully any issues that you look at today that are requests for term changes or new terms should have followed this templating. Some of them don't and some of them have a label to that effect. And so one thing you could do if you're interested in a term and want to move it forward, uh, and it doesn't have the requisite information, you could help to provide that. So I will leave the introduction at that point. Again, here's, I'll leave this up. That URL at the bottom is our Google Doc where we're capturing ongoing commentaries, what people say, etc. If you're more comfortable putting the questions into the chat, the Zoom chat, feel free to do that. So it's open for questions. Uh, I need to switch out of this mode so that I can see what's going on. In Zoom. Here are my moderators are helping. The first question that came in, John, um, came from Tommy McElrath. If someone has an idea for a task group, um, how and when should they bring that up in Tadwig? Okay, so that's a little bit involved. Depends on what it is that that task group is hoping to do. So usually, the usual route is that a task group will be spawned from activities within an interest group. The interest group gets together, they have uh, periodic meetings, they discuss things, and then they get an aha idea. Let's make something happen. And interest groups already have the know-how, the experience, or how to create task groups. And so that's probably the easiest way, the, the, the easiest road to creating new activity. If you wanted to do it, go solo, that's more complicated. You, you have to understand the entire process of how the interest in task groups go. You could propose, for example, if it was a change to Darwin Core or a set of changes or an extension you thought to make for Darwin Core, you feel free to ask uh, any of us who are in this maintenance group and we can guide it as well. I don't see any hands up, so I'll read out the next question to you, John. Um, in Darwin Core, and this comes from David Smith, is there a plan to include non-biodiversity data, such as non-paleo earth science in the future, the same way that ABCD was extended with EFG? Here, I have to fall back on all of our principles and our ways of 
operating. So to do that, I need to make clear that the maintenance group doesn't in and of itself have agendas other than to make sure that the thing is maintained. Like we have the agenda to make sure that Darwin Core followed the new rules for standards. But other than that, we don't say, ah, the Darwin Core must do the following. Instead, we respond to what the community demands. And if the demand can be sufficiently shown and justified, then change can occur. So the, the simple answer is no. Darwin Core Maintenance Group and no one that I know of has that as a current goal because it hasn't showed up on our radar in our issues in our maintenance group. But it's by no means an obstacle for it to happen. There is an awful lot of discussion going on on the notes document at the moment. I encourage everybody to, uh, to open that. There's an interesting one here, John, that I think uh, your comments would be uh, useful on. It's from Brian. I see a lot of emphasis on the process of creating terms and maintaining these terms, but very little on measuring the impacts on the user side. Are they being used correctly? Very, very nice. Um, it's not actually part of our, uh, our set of written tasks say to monitor that sort of thing but it just so happens that all of the people within the maintenance group are extremely interested in that topic and so we are occupied for example in other tadrig interest groups like that one for data quality and out of that for example trying to uh, put forward the best practices for the creation and maintenance of vocabularies, which is one of the, the places where Darwin course sort of leaves off. I'm using this only as an example, but to show that, that we're keenly interested in the topic that you brought up. So under the data quality interest group, Paola, who is a core member of this interest group, is, has a task group to try and define find those best practices. And the reason that it's where Darwin Core leaves off is that Darwin Core sort of as a principle says, we are not going to create restrictions on the content of the terms that we define. That that should be somewhere outside of the standard itself. Now there's a lot of debate about that and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing but it's based on that principle of making it simple for people to share things and that share what you will. It's one way for us to understand what you have and what your problems have are if the uh, issue with the data quality. So this means that because of that simple and controversial principle, we have exactly the data as the people out there in the world have them to share, which is interesting. It allows us to learn things and to build tools to help to standardize and search on those wildly diverse data. So I hope that answers the question. It's just one example of how we do pay attention to what's happening in the world at large. Thanks, John. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone on the call, if you wish to speak, could you please raise your hand using the, um, the Zoom raise hand function? If not, I will continue to pick questions and throw them out there. Um, I have one from Jorrit, which I think is very relevant here. Can you walk through an example of a life cycle for a, pro for a proposed term that got accepted so that we can get a sense of the timeline, 
the effort and the folks that are involved in that process. So a new term in something like Darwin Core. Sure. And this is quite relevant to what we're trying to accomplish coming out of this meeting right now. Since we moved into the core business of being a maintenance group, and that is to let the standard evolve based on current needs, this is a perfect question. So what happens is we work on the definition of a term, whether it's a new term or a term change, in the GitHub repository using commentary. And we also, um, where more broad participation is needed because we're aware that GitHub might be a slight obstacle for some people, we try to also bring that conversation out further using the Tadwig content, content list and then also a combination of social media, which we need to start doing better at. Uh, that's to get the people who, um, who are interested involved in the definition of the term or change to the term. So once that is resolved, all the prerequisites for a new term or a term change have been met, which include that a demand has been shown. And demand means not that somebody came in and said, I must have this term, but rather that somebody comes in and says, look, not only I, but this group and that group need to be able to share this kind of data in order to accomplish the following. That is, there needs to be more than one independent group who has a new need that is um, met by a term addition or term change. That need is shown. Uh, there are other prerequisites that are codified in the vocabulary maintenance specification that show that not only is there demand, but that the, uh, the change will be, will not adversely affect stability in a way that basically makes it not worth doing. And the third one, maybe Steve can help me. I don't have it on the tip of my tongue. There's a third prerequisite for making term changes. Stability requirement, uh, demand requirement, and another requirement. I'll move on for the moment. Um, so once all of that has been demonstrated, it means that the request is mature, mature enough to go for public review. And so we have right now a set of six proposals under public review for term changes and the addition of vocabularies. And that has been widely publicized across all the, all the places that we can think of to get people involved. So that's the, the world's chance to jump in and say, uh, you know, this is a great idea, but we have a community here that would understand it a lot better if you just phrased it like this, to be more inclusive. Or, you know what, that's actually diametrically opposed to how we do things and we suggest that it be modified in the following way. If that happens, it means that despite the term request being mature, there's still controversy. And one of the things that we need to accomplish before anything actually gets incorporated into the standard is a consensus. Consensus is defined here that the definition the, the proposal reaches a state where no one argues that it shouldn't be done or that it shouldn't be done the way that it's being proposed. Uh, having reached that state, which might mean that the 30 day cycle gets repeated again, if a, a major change is proposed and, and worked on. If that happens, we keep going until there's either consensus or it's clear that we're not able to reach a consensus currently and the, uh, the proposal goes into a semi-perpetual state of discussion. 
but not implementation. If consensus is reached, then the formal proposal for the change is produced by the maintenance group to present to the executive committee. And it's basically a summary of all the considerations that went into its creation, who said it was important and why, why it's going to be useful, that the maintenance uh, interest group sees no apparent problem with it, and they might determine that in, um, in conjunction with the technical architecture group of Tadwig, which is another interest group, just to make sure that by doing this, we aren't really going to break everything that we've built so far. So it, the proposal having gone to the executive committee has a certain period, I think it's 30 days for the executive committee to consider. And at that point, the, um, if the thumbs up comes back, then the maintenance group needs to occupy itself in putting it into implementation, which means making the actual changes to the standard and publishing them. So in terms of all the parts of the timeline, an undisclosed amount of time to produce a document that's mature and ready to review, which doesn't come from the maintenance group, will help, but that action, that work has to be done by somebody who has the need. The maintenance group tries to stay neutral in terms of needs. We're here to help, not to have an agenda. So once it does get to the point where the maintenance says it's mature, it's 30 days minimum to have that by the community. If all goes well there, uh, the maintenance group, hopefully very quickly in the terms of days or a week, can turn that around and send it to the executive committee who can review it in their weekly or biweekly meetings at their discretion, but up to 30 days. And then the thumbs up coming back um, to the maintenance group means that then we take as short a time as possible to get those changes implemented and published into the standard, all of its documents, its quick reference guide, et cetera, et cetera. So think on the order of three months minimum for something that's well organized. Thank you, John. And while you were talking, um, the word you were missing was efficacy, the one that we all have to Google oh. to understand what it means. But that is now in the notes documents, including the extract from the vocabulary maintenance standard. So it's been answered in text as well. I'm going to go ahead and bold the three things that are the requirements. There's the demand requirement, the efficacy requirement, which means that what's being proposed is going to do what it proposes to do. Thank you. That's, that's useful. And then finally, the stability requirement. Okay, excellent. The, the very next question, I think, is a, is a, a good one. Thank you, David Shorthouse. Um, there are some IRI counterparts to terms in Darwin Core. What is the process for their creation and maintenance? Very good question. <clears throat> and what has happened to date is that we, some years ago, decided that there was an omission among the kinds of standard documentation in Darwin Core, which was how to use Darwin Core in a linked open data framework. How do you do Darwin Core in RDF as opposed to in text or in XML, which we already have guidelines for. When we did that work, we decided that for every term where it made sense, we were going to generate an IRI counterpart, that is an RDF capable counterpart whose content was meant to be an IRI, not a string literal value for all of those terms. So if you look in the RDF guide, you'll see how to do Darwin Core in RDF, and you'll see that there are exact copies of the names of most of the terms that can be used in that way. 
but they have a different namespace. So normally, I mean, most of the time, most of the people aren't concerned with namespaces. They just see a Darwin core term name, something like geodetic datum, and they fill a, an Excel spreadsheet under a column named geodetic datum, and off we go. But it's filled with text. Strictly speaking, that data is meant to go into the namespace DWC, the part of Darwin core that is not meant necessarily to contain IRIs. They can, they can contain just strings. There is, however, a geodetic datum term with the namespace DWC IRI in front of it. And that means that if you fill that field, which is a different field, even though it looks like it has the same name, same label, you need to do so with an IRI, not with a string literal. So you can't put the word, the letters WGS84 in there. What you need to do is put the URL to the definition of WGS84, the one that you mean, because there's more than one of them, uh, into, the, into a, basically an HTTP uh, form, a URL. So that, sort of answers how do we get to the Darwin core terms that are IRI counterparts so far. The, the question is relevant because we're about to add terms for the first time since those came into being where we don't have the counterparts already. So we haven't actually discussed this fully and properly, but I think I'm going to speak for my counterparts in the maintenance group. I think that the intention is to create the counterparts automatically at the same time, when that makes sense. Um, if there's any argument against that, speak now. Uh, but I think that that's how it will go. Hey, John, can I make a comment? Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, so I've been writing some um, notes uh, about this, but I think that um, for the new terms that um, that have controlled values, it's in the proposal uh, documents, I believe, that the IRI terms would be created simultaneously with the DWC ones. Um, and because in the process of defining the controlled vocabularies, we are, def we are defining both an IRI value for the controlled uh, value and that would be used with the DWC IRI namespace variant and then we also have controlled value strings that would be used with the DWC uh, namespace properties. So I, I think that at least for the what terms like the degree of establishment and so on that is in the proposal somewhere I'll have to check um, in the case of the existing terms, like John said, we kind of went through and tried to make decisions on that. I'm not 100% sure we got everything right, but this would, the details are in the RDF guide. And if anybody disagrees <laughs> with the decisions that we made, uh, that would be a topic that someone could bring up in terms of like a term proposal. The good here is that people can propose the new terms and term changes without having to go through the effort of defining what the IRI part would be like. The maintenance group can occupy itself with that and make sure that it makes sense and so on. Hopefully that is to keep a barrier out of the way of change because it might not be within everybody's uh, technical capacities to understand and define the RI complex. Yeah, so just to clarify, I'm looking at the proposal for degree of establishment and section two says, due to the requirements of the RDF guide, term IRIs must be used as value for DWC IRI degree of establishment, controlled value strings must be used as values of DWC degree of establishment. So yeah, it's in the proposal and I don't know if the proposal 
explicitly says we will create the DWC IRI, but it's least at least implicit in the uh, in the um, introduction to the proposal for the controlled vocabulary. Right. So here Steve's talking about something that's open for public commentary now, where the group who made the proposal did so in a whole set of terms and was very complete about the due diligence on defining those terms and, and how they would come about, including the publication before the proposals were made of a uh, journal article, a peer reviewed journal article, explaining what the rationale was and uh, explaining how it would be used by different communities and, and so on. So that's a, a stellar example of how to effect change by having done all of your homework. So again, that's one of the sets of things that's under current uh, open community review. John, while well, we have a, a pause there, um, we're now uh, one, in, one hour into the, the session. If we want to break out, I suggest we consider doing it now. Um, or if we wish to continue the group discussion, um, we could do so. Do we have an easy way to make a poll, an easy, quick way to make a poll of sorts? Not that I'm aware of. I can possibly make one real quick. It would just take a minute or two. Everyone could press yes or no next to the raised hand, or do they want to break out? We could do that with raised hands, yeah. Um, let me explain before we do any such thing. The proposal would be to stop this questions and answers momentarily in this main room in order to allow groups with special interests, three different categories of interests, to go and look at some real Darwin core issues that exist, discuss them and see if any progress can be made on moving them forward with the guidance of people from our maintenance group. There, there are three different categories of them. One is all taxonomy and identification term related issues. A second one is all location and event term change uh, issues. And the third one is a little bit more of a mixed bag of things that include um, occurrence, uh, occurrence class term changes and some record level ones like institution acronyms and identifiers and things like that, more of a mixed bag. So the proposal then would be that those who do have interest in actually getting their hands into those things, looking, seeing how we, how we move issues forward can do that. And that will keep this room functional to continue on with general questions. So if that seems like an, a reasonable idea to the majority of folks, we'll go ahead with that. If no, no one really wants to go into the separate rooms and do any work, then we'll stay here and we'll keep answering questions. So if you could, please use the raise hand feature to signify whether or not you, yes, want to go to breakout rooms. Raise your hand if you want to go. And we'll give that a, a minute or two. Meanwhile, let's, let's answer one more question if there's still one around. Do we have another pending question? And I can deal with short, quickly. I see in the list of participants that there are some who have 
check marks as opposed to raised hands. Those of you who have check marks, does that mean yes? I would like to go to another room. If so, could you please change it to a hand up? Do we get them all in one list at the top? Okay, it looks like that resolved it. To me, it looks like we have enough people that want to do work that we might well get something accomplished if those people go to rooms and we can keep everybody else here. So let's go take the next step in that direction. If you want to go to one of the three rooms, then what we'd like you to do is to add a number, actually, even if you want to stay here, everyone's going to add a number next to their name. Is that how we propose to do it, Holly? Yes, and I just put the numbers and room names in the chat again. Okay, so in the chat you'll see what number to put by your name to determine where you will be sent. After a period of time, which I think we were going to leave maybe half an hour for this, we'll bring everybody back into the room and hopefully people who have gone on to different rooms can tell us if they accomplished anything or if it was just too much of a, a confusion. Um, real quick, if you can, you'll need to hover over your name in the participants list and where you see the option for more, you can rename yourself and add that number to the beginning of your name. It looks like everybody's getting that. Anybody who hasn't put a number, even if you're staying in this room, please put a number. So we know that you uh, that we're not doing something against you though. I think that we're starting to get enough people for different rooms to start instantiating those rooms and sending people to them. And then once that's done. Yeah, I'll start moving people. But again, for anyone that's putting it into the chat, if you could add it to your name, please. By default, if you put nothing in front of your name, you will stay here anyway, but whether we're done or not is why to put a number in front. But anyway, okay, I think we can, we can move people. So this is a while. I can't quite figure out how to get the number in front of my name. I'd like to put a one there, but I don't see how to do that. Okay. Um, let's see if I can show it. I, I can't actually do it. Can I? Is Sorry. that Richard that just said that? Richard Pyle? Yes, yes. Well, all right. Richard Pyle just said that. Yes. If you would like see a it one. On my screen, I can show it. Here I am at the top. I do that. There's a, a drop down for more on the right of my name if I hover over my name. We're not seeing it, we're only seeing your meeting notes. I have renamed okay. Richard. Thanks, Tim. I, I tried the more option, but there didn't seem to be anything. It only allowed me to change my profile picture, but maybe that was where I should have done it. Richard, that option's not available in Hawaii. I'm sorry. Evidently <laughs> not. <laughs> Send Rich to one. Okay, I'm going to open the breakout rooms now. Thank you. See you all in a bit. How, how long will breakout rooms run for? Let's go for a half hour. It'll leave us 25 minutes at the end, is that right? 
Yes. Okay. Uh, Okay, it looks like most people have moved. Is there Federico, anyone? What? Federico Mendez still has a one in front of the name. Is there still someone? Yeah. You see him? One Federico. I don't. Oh, there's. That's me. Okay. <laughs> Looks like we're good. Uh, and in each of those rooms was a moderator already. All good. Um. I. I know Marcus was going to go to taxonomy, and Steve had selected. Uh, uh, rather, Tim had selected locations, and I suspect somebody went to the third one. I hope Steve did. Yeah. Let me double check. Yeah, Marcus is in one. Yeah, Peter Tim and Steve. In two. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. We're in good shape. Okay, so the rest of us who remain here, the microphone is open for questions, discussions, complaints, etc. And uh, we have some other topics that are interesting that, that we think are interesting that we can fill time with as well if you don't have one. But let's get your questions in first either in the chat or in the shared sort of document. Or if you had a question already that wasn't answered, we somehow missed it, go ahead and raise your hand and we'll open the mic for you as well. Sorry, one more question for the breakout rooms. What time do you want to end them? I'm going to just send a message to everybody. Okay, let's let's make it easy and go with um, 22 minutes from now. Okay, thank you. So how many of the people that stayed in this main room are new to Darwin Core and or to Tadwin? Can you please type a, an exclamation mark in the chat? And among let me add uh, another one, and that is you may be new to Tadwig, but are there people who are unfamiliar with Darwin Core and its uses, even at that level? If so, let's put in a plus sign. Okay, so we still have some people who are new to Tadwig. The Darwin Core isn't a complete mystery. That's good. But presumably you're here because you're interested in Darwin Core and something about it. Is there any nagging question or concern that you have? So maybe John, I would I would ask the people if if you're willing to, to speak up, is what what 
brings you here for all of all of you that are new to to this community how did you end up here and what do you expect to get from this community and, and from this interest group in particular if you if you wish not because we want to send you away but because we want to make sure you if you do go away you're happy So no questions so far, not here, nor in the notes. I know so you why are you here, Dave? Dave Bloom, why are you in this meeting? I'm pointing at you. Where did you point at? At Dave. Isn't Dave in, in on our room? <laughs> He was gonna. Okay, he's back. Oh, I'm here. I just, uh, I'm, I'm here because J John and Paula expected me to be here. No, uh, perhaps uh, are any of you who are in this room? Uh, do you, uh, do you maintain data that needs to be published to GBIF or other data portals um, that hasn't been published yet, or uh, are you all already in? some of those portals right now and and perhaps have questions about how to publish your data more efficiently using darwin core meanwhile i do have a question or an observation from carlos martinez so let me actually address that carlos says he wants to get to know some people and see how tadwig works that's interesting because this is the first time that tadwig has ever worked this way uh, this virtual meeting is not how we do things normally. If you were to go to a meeting in person in the past, this maintenance interest group meeting would have been publicized and it would have been open, but it probably would have been a room full of the very few organizers who are on one table playing board games and on the other doing the standards uh, maintenance work but all night long and all day long. So it's not typical what we're doing now. And we're trying to take advantage of this, uh, this, let's say, opportunity to let people understand how at least the maintenance itself works and get people more involved if they care to. Something I hadn't said yet is that the maintenance group membership is not a closed thing. The, the folks who are in it are all super hard working and very complementary in their skills and their time zones and we work well together um, and we're always happy to other have other people who are of a similar vein and especially who played board games to get involved Need to enable Carlos, I think. Yep. So, there you go. Okay. Yeah. So many thanks. I'm really happy to join. Um, and uh, I'm originally from Cuba, and uh, Cuba has a long history in trying to standardize things. So I guess that my initial interest for data standardization comes from my national background. And then as a taxonomist, I'm, I also got more interest in standardizing data and we, I work on Miriapoda and we are lucky enough that we have uh, at least two databases on Miriapoda, one in centipedes and one in uh, millipedes and other minor classes. And of course, there are all these other parallel databases on, on uh, paleo taxa and some marine so the 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 index by tony reese and so the interim register 
And now I'm working on a new database, uh, Miriatrix, which is uh, scratch pads based. And then I'm actually really worried because uh, the development of scratch pads is uh, lagging behind other databases. And um, I would like to implement many terms, but at the same time, I would also like to make the internal structure of those new terms uh, Darwin Core compliant. Because um, normally when you establish some machine names inside the system, then they cannot easily be changed or you need to redo the work if you want a different name. So I would like to, to start making the, the new terms Darwin Core compliant and using the same that you are using and, and um, annotating the, the new structure with your for example, your, your quick reference guide and the new things I start using from there. And then on the other hand, I will also like to use, uh, like to, to make the data in my papers more standard. And if I can add uh, like specimen data in Darwin Core format, then I would like to do that uh, for a paper and have like a um, supplementary file that I can deposit in Senodo or somewhere. So well, there are many things that I could learn from this community. <laughs> and of course, I can also bring my own use cases and, and propose new terms. Uh, you already saw this um, uh, type uh, locality and verbatim type locality proposal. And I, I'm thinking now that maybe that has uh, more to do with the taxonomic uh, concept and name interest group, because they are working on, on taxon concepts so maybe that's a, a those are fields to propose for them to use because yeah uh, the the concepts of a species are also tied to type locality so maybe that's something they would like to share and i have talked too much already <laughs> no it's good to know we, we see your name around and now we see a face as well and and know what you're on about great I see Florencia Gratalola put in a comment about wanting to be a better Darwin Core user. There's no such thing as a bad Darwin Core user. As long as you're using it, you're in the club. <laughs> um, but do you have anything more specific? Anything that you need in order to be a better user that you think you need to be a better user? Hi. Um, wait. I'm this as well. Um, well, I've been. Um, hi, everyone. I've been standardizing data um, two years ago, so I've learned everything really kind of fast and uh, not in in the best way, I think. So I, I keep learning on how to use it properly, the the standard. Uh, so. I don't know, I think this is really helpful also to understand how it's structured and the people that may make it and how it works, how you propose stuff, how vocabulary gets integrated into each term and things like this. And so I'm, I'm from Uruguay, I'm in the UK, but um, so Uruguay does not have any standard databases and uh, we're building with the, uh, a, a, Kind of a scientific organization. Uh, we have in Uruguay um, a consortium of data. We started to build the first databases of biodiversity. So, first it was vertebrates, now plants, and it's been a, a whole new experience. So, yeah, um, I'm just here to understand a bit more. And, well, maybe at a point, uh, try to help. Um, I want to point out that it's interesting the um, mix of people from around the world, which is uh, it's notorious, let's say, and it's good. I think that's really interesting. And um, yeah, it's usually uh, things are more Western center, so I think this is a good space to build from other parts. Um, that's it. <laughs> 
Well, that's good. Thank you. And um, one of the things we hope to get across is that something that you don't get by not being at a meeting in person, maybe. And that is that this group is super friendly. The entire organization of Tadrig and the people who attend it and are associated with it tend to be really helpful people and really knowledgeable people and try to share that knowledge in a way that's not demeaning, you know, and, uh, and that's welcoming. So um, feel free to, to contact anybody in the organization to let them know what you're doing, to let them know if you have an idea or uh, if there's something that's just not working well for you. Pretty much everybody is open for, for, uh, to help in whatever way that they can. It might be a good time for Paula and her burning question because um, Florencia mentioned the, the broadness, the global scope, global aspect to the organization. And I know that you have a burning desire to take that a step further. So um, I was looking right now at the list of people that we have in this room, and I see a lot of non-English names. Quite a bit of Spanish names on the list, but I recognize also people that talk Portuguese and they talk Chinese and probably other languages. I'm, I'm just scrolling through. So about broadening, I think that's one of the one of the gaps that we need to fill in for Darwin Code and for Tarwig in general. Let's try to include more people from the languages perspective so that everyone can understand what we're talking about. Is, is that what you, what you wanted me to, to refer to, John? You're muted. Yeah, maybe I should make a, a quick introduction to you in your other role because Paula is not only a member of the maintenance group for Darwin Core, but she's also a South American representative on the TABIG executive committee. And so in that role across the organization, um, I think that she is one who's hoping to push forward more inclusiveness uh, and more uh, availability of our materials in multiple languages, something that has never been attempted in any serious way before, except by saying, oh, if you have interest, please submit your translations to like, the term definitions and things like that. So I think you in particular want to take that even further. Well, I can, I can I can try to push for Spanish, but I need the help of the other representatives in the rest of the world for the rest. I mean, I can go for the languages, well, Spanish and Portuguese and the languages that are um, mostly used in, in, in Latin America. But I think it's a broader, it's a broader issue, the um, broadening the community. It, languages is a start, but there is also other considerations, like we need to understand that there is people with different levels of expertise and that everyone is welcome and that everyone has something to share, some knowledge to, to, to share with, with the rest of the community. So my comment on all this thing would be, given that we have a lot of new people here, is you're all more than welcome and you're more than welcome to ask those questions that you might think are silly questions, but are never, never silly. They, we ask those kind of questions ourselves all the time and we have to review and revise and consult with others. So um, I, I think the, commu the target community is the, is the people. It, it's not the standards themselves, but the people that actually work on them, that develop them and maintain them. And, and so that's, that would be my call, that getting contact with the 
the conveners, the members of the groups. Some might take longer to answer your email, but everyone is very willing to, to, to welcome you in, in, in these groups. And, but, but we need not only us reaching out, but you reaching to us. So please don't be shy and try to connect and ask all that you need to, to ask. That's, that's the most important thing. That I remember when I first went to the Chadwick meeting, I was so overwhelmed and so shy and everyone was talking difficult. And it's like, it's like I, I don't grab not 20% not, not of what all these people is saying. And I, I was kind of afraid in that community, but I found that starting to talk with one person or another person or another, it's like they have the same uh, concerns that we have and they have the same kind of problems and and everyone approached them differently. So it's very, it's very interesting to see those different approaches and, and, and people working together from, from different perspectives. So that, get in touch, please get in touch. You're muted again, John. Do you think it's interesting or useful to share some broad results of your survey? Well, I could try to find it, but I can, but I can tell you, I can tell you here more or less that what John is talking about is a survey that we distributed among Latin American uh, and Spanish people from Spain. Um, Com the, the communities there that it was mainly distributed through node managers which chief of node managers so it's collection stuff and and all the related people you know so so that you have an idea so the the questions that we put in in we distributed a form that had a series of questions that were related to how the language affects our participation in, in this community. So how it affects our participation in conferences and how it affects us using the standards and understanding the standards. And so the results that we got were very, very interesting, 100 and, uh, and something answers for that. And so basically, just to summarize, 60% uh, of the people is not comfortable going to conferences that are in other languages that are not their own. And a bigger percentage of those people do not present in another language that is not their own, which means they are not sharing their knowledge. They're not sharing their expertise. And also they are having trouble getting the expertise from the community. So we asked actually three different questions. Is do you go to the, to the conferences? Then do you participate giving talks, for instance? And do you interact with, with your colleagues? And in all three categories, we found that people had trouble communicating. And it was independent people from different, different parts. And it was interesting to see that many of those people are actually uh, in positions where we would have expected that they felt a little more comfortable because they deal with international partners all the time. And even so, they, they really don't feel comfortable, right? And also we found out that even, even a, an important percentage just does not go to the conferences, or does not participate and does not present in anything that is not in their own language. So given that, I think there is a huge missed opportunity to include those people in our community in, in, in both ways, right? They learn from us and we learn from them. So we're missing knowledge there. So I, I can share with you, uh, I'll try to find the, the results and I can put the link in the, in the notes document so you can actually see them. I'll see if I can find them quick. Then. I'm gonna send the breakouts a one minute warning and then bring everybody back. Okay, great. Uh, and I think Paula, if uh, the abstract gets accepted, will be talking on that same subject in the main meeting. Is that right? 
Sorry, what was that? I, I... If, if your abstract is accepted, you'll be talking about that problem in the main meeting. Is that true? Yes, we did. We did submit an abstract for you know, our presentation that is going to show not only the results from from this survey, but also possible ways forward. Like, okay, we complain, but we need to do something about it. So GBIF has done something about it. All all of you who who have heard about the GBIF translators know that there is a community of translators in GBIF that work um, very hard to to help GBIF make their their documentation and their materials available in, in many different languages. So they have a, a, a way, a system that, some mechanics that has worked very well. There have been uh, things that we've learned on, on, on the way, we as translators, but I think, I think it works pretty well. And so that could be a possible model that to, to, to understand if that could work for TADWIF. Because Tanwi has its own particularities, right? Like standards have like normative things that have to happen and that have to happen in English. So that for one, so we have to be aware of that. So there are things that are still going to be in English, but we can still have translations, but that means a maintenance issue. So the whole model has to take into account several aspects and we as the community must be willing to take that responsibility to follow up with these things. It's like we cannot just, ah, oh, we are super enthusiastic now and we make a whole bunch of translations into every language and then next year something changes and no one updates the documentation then that, all that was just lost effort. So the model has to be a little more well thought of there. So yeah. We'll see if the abstract gets accepted. Uh, we'll be talking about that, but I'm, I'm sure at, at least in the Latin American community, you will be hearing about this further because independently of that presentation, the survey is going to, the results of the survey is going to be presented to the TADWIC executive. I'm gonna do that as a regional representative. So, so they will know if any other people from other languages wants to, wants to participate or know a little more, just ping me or shoot me an email. Well, Holly is bringing folks back. Um, could you let me know when everyone is back? All rooms should be closed. So they should okay. be, that's the last bit popping up now. <laughs> okay, cool. I know because I'm subscribed to the Durham Core uh, Issues repository that a lot of stuff actually got entered in there. I'm excited to see what happened. Um, I know that that was very little time to get any real work done, but hopefully those who went off to the other rooms were able to get a taste of the kinds of things that we need to deal with on an ongoing basis. So. Um, I'm particularly interested in a broader question around the taxonomy and identification set of terms. So for those who you went off to that room, what I'd like to know uh, in order to strategize going forward is what to do about the, the current state of those requests. The, situation is that we have some term requests that are very mature the, the person or persons who requested them did a lot of work to make sure that they were well defined and that they had demand demonstrated and that they are a good idea to go forward with on the other hand, there are a lot of other terms that are essentially very similar to the ones that are mature, but don't have those same characteristics of, of being mature. And yet, if eventually those terms need to come into Darwin Core, it would be better for everyone if all of them came in together, all the ones that make sense. So right now we're in a sort of a state of deciding should we make one more push to find out if the remaining terms 
really have the support and demand that has been demonstrated in the other ones or not. And only then try to make a, a big set of changes of all the related terms together. Because doing it that way really helps the community that consumes this. If it's not one new taxonomic term for subfamily comes in this week because the work was done correctly, and another one for tribe comes in three months from now because the people who are supporting that finally showed the demand, et cetera. Uh, especially for the people who do aggregation, the people who are building tools around the Darwin core as a standard, it's much better that there are fewer changes. Actually, the number of them maybe doesn't matter, but that they come in sets rather than just any time. So from that group, do you have a sense of whether a lot of the ones that are not mature just never will be? or if they can be moved forward to try to achieve the, the kind of group ratification that I'm hoping for? So I had my little hand up there. I hope it's all right if I jump in on this. Um, I don't have a direct answer to that question right. I'm sorry, this is Richard Pyle. Um, I don't have a direct question answer to that question right now, but there is a very active TNC group, taxon names and concept groups going on right now. And there is non-trivial overlap between the Darwin core terms involving taxonomy, not so much identification, but the taxon sets with what that group's working on. So I guess my gut feeling is that based on what you said, it's better to have these things come in block sets rather than trickles and drib drabs. Um, it might be, make most sense to let that group run its course and come to some conclusion and at that point make a decision about what taxonomic terms ought to change or disappear or be added to the Darwin core set as opposed to essentially just being plumbed out to the whole TNC scope. And, and that's my sense. I haven't conferred this with Niels or anybody else in the group, but I'd like to hear what their thoughts are. The mic is open for answers to that. And thank you for that. That's I had suspected and I'd hoped that there might be somebody from that group here. This is excellent. If I can just quickly jump in, John. So there's a couple of various sets of terms, like you said, but they're not all of them one big set. So there's all these rank terms, basically, the higher ranks one, which should all be together, definitely, I think. And that definitely needs, that looks like a, just a, kind of arbitrary selection right now. And that would definitely benefit from doing it in one shot together and postpone it a bit and uh, redo it once again. But I think in our subgroup, there were at least three or four people immediately saying that this is very useful for their project they're working on. So there is demand. Um, I just don't feel it's very consistent what we have there right now. On the other hand, there's things like this accepted name usage ID, where we just don't want to have new terms, but just change the definition, which I think is quite important that we do that as soon as possible, rather. And, and then it's very isolated from the rest again. So I don't think all, one, you can all of uh, judge all of them together. And, but is that one, the tax on name usage ID, is that one independent of the work in the TNC? It, 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 independent, it's it's fundamental to the, what the TNC is working on. Basically, right. the core object that's emerging from TNC is this taxon name usage. And you remember years ago when I lobbied you to add that usage qualifier to all those taxon names, it was anticipation in anticipation of what we're doing right now in TNC. It was obviously way ahead <laughs> because they've been sitting there dormant. But what's going to emerge from TNC is going to make the usage part of those terms make a lot more sense. Okay. So it would be nice if we can get a sort of loose commitment from one or more people in TNC to help guide us on timing here, pay attention to those terms and say, hey, here we think the time is right now because this is all solidified. We can help do the justifications, et cetera, et cetera. 
Yeah, I think there are enough of us overlapping between the, the Darwin Core group and the TNC group that, that that message will get communicated. My understanding, and Niels, you can correct me on this, is that we're tentatively looking at kind of an 18 month time frame on this. Maybe you can qualify that more. Yeah, can I make sorry. a comment? Oh, uh, sorry. Niels was confirming 18 months, more or less. Oh, yeah, that's what we're planning for the, uh, uh, yeah, basically for the new version of uh, TCS. Um, yeah, but we would, we're definitely happy to help out with uh, getting those Darwin core. Uh, yeah, this terms look that basically. Uh, yeah. Sorry, it's, it's been a very long day for me. It's, it's, it's 2 a.m. here. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, we're happy to help. A lot of them are identification terms, uh, actually. So, the, uh, uh, yeah, so they're more, uh, more tangential to uh, what we're doing. Uh, but, yeah, they're especially important for the uh uh you know for current staff uh, obviously but uh, yeah there's definitely like rich said a lot of overlap so uh we can have a look at those definitions and see if we reckon it will work that's good to know i mean from where we our understanding a week ago is that okay these are just recommended by someone but don't really have any support maybe but no it's good to know Steve, you had something to add? Well, I, I was going to make a, a kind of a general comment, and this is partly in response to something Brian brought up in our um, breakout group. Um, his comment was that, that perhaps one reason for the lack of commentary on terms is that people are not really thinking about the implications of what are the implications of these term changes or these new terms on the actual end users. And the comment that I was going to make is that, to some extent, um, the process that we're using here is not really what our peer standards organizations do. So, what, uh, so I was the lead author on the vocabulary maintenance specification, and a part of that work was to look at how uh, our aspirational peers like W3C and IETF uh, handle the standards process. And, both of those organizations have a workflow that involves um, a requirement to collect use cases and implementation experience prior to making any changes to a standard. That's not the way individual term changes have been done historically, and so we didn't put that in the vocabulary maintenance specification. Um, there is a section, I just put it in the chat, about um, vocabulary enhancements, and, and this is like very vague, but it, it sort of touches on what we're talking here about coordinated packages of things. So the idea is that it's pro it is a best practice when you are suggesting more widespread changes that involve a number of terms that, um, that the use cases be documented and that people actually try to see how they would work uh, as opposed to making the changes and then after we've ratified them, figuring out whether they work or not. So, um, so I, I think in the case of like TNC, this is a very complicated beast with a lot of moving parts and there has been a process of assembling use cases and I'm assuming that there will be some uh, testing of the whatever terms and models we get developed prior to adopting it as a standard. But we don't have that kind of a requirement if somebody just says, I want to change an individual term or I want to propose a term. And so I think that's part of why we have these different categories of things that move rather quickly because they're just a simple small change versus things that move slowly because they're more complicated including that part where it doesn't even require the public review. Now, suppose you have a good example for a term that's not there that would help uh, the understanding of how a term could be used. That can be uh, discussed with 
the maintenance group and and put into implementation readily without you know, changing the whole standard. I think the resource relationship change proposals are an example of something that would probably have major uh, implications. And so, you know, de having defined use cases and and testing of how would this implementation work if we made these changes would make people feel more comfortable that that nothing is going to get broken if the changes were made. Okay, um, I think Peter had a virtual hand up because he can't do it actually. In, in yeah, I, I, just on what uh, Steve is saying on the resource relationship, uh, there's two uh, issues there that have been, I mean, one has been proposed for a long time by uh, Jorit Pullen, and I think those two together um, could also uh, be seen as like a block of changes that could be added to Darwin Core, just as the ones we have for invasive species or the ones regarding taxonomy. So that is one where we have to see in the Darwin group maintenance group uh, how we can move them forward and if they're ready. And if we need to consider them together or separately. I'm just going to post in the chat which ones those are. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, from the group that dealt with location and event, I think that's the one that also included, or, or am I wrong, that the ones that are under public review are in the third category. And speaking of pathway and establishment means and those vocabularies associated, were those assessed or did you deal with those as basically that's already in good state, we don't have to really discuss that. I, in the beginning of the third group breakout, I uh, solicited uh, comments and questions and n nobody had any, we quickly moved on to resource relationships. So it didn't seem that there were any controversies involved with those. Okay. You went to the nasty stuff, great. <laughs> um, for locations and events, that was a mixed bag of requests and some some very strange and interesting things, including um, a, a reclassification of one of the terms into a different class, something we realized in the rewriting of the georeferencing best practices that one of those terms uh, really doesn't belong in the location class at all because the statement about not just the location, but how georeference was applied to a location. And therefore, it's about the occurrence. Um, but do you have any broad observations from that group about the terms that were there uh, and whether things can be moved forward easily or not? We, we mostly discuss the event and the use of the SAR schema and how events are handled and events applying to other fields like camera traps and sort of how that kind of data fits in within the Darwin core and what are the limitations and where we're finding issues and that sort of thing. Are sort of concentrated on. Okay, so that's beyond the set of issues that was in there. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a, a low pending problem. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's a wider expanse of, of the ap the application of the star schema and the existing fields for other uh, camera trap like camera trap data sets and other types of things uh, beyond sort of collections and how those things fit if they do fit and how they fit and, and if if they can't you know is there a, what's the way to accommodate those things into the current standard? Uh -huh. Okay. That's actually a big thing to tackle in the less than half hour that we had. <laughs> it was. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, when we're done here, I'm going to go and review the, the comments that were made on issues as a result of this exercise. And we very much appreciate the efforts that you made here and hope that it was useful for you to see how this works uh, and pretend to, to be part of the maintenance group. <laughs> indentured servants here. Um, we have maybe 10 minutes left and it's open for people to make any other comments that they like before we try to wrap things up. John, Jonathan Pai says that the machine observations working group tomorrow might be a good place to discuss the topic more. Check the agenda for what time that is for you. 
local want to see that. And John, can I jump in here for a second? What? So uh, one of the things that Group 3 talked about also was the way that we make people aware. It's kind of about the impact, which, which um, Brian and Jean had brought up. But uh, how do we make people aware that uh, there is a public review or that these kinds of issues are being talked about? Of course, there's more than one way to do that. But specific to public review, we talked a little bit about tabloid content and those of us who you know, understand tabloid content have seen that it's really dropped off in sort of use as a, as a platform, as a discussion place. But as Steve points out, it's also very valuable in the sense of the history of it uh, and as sort of a permanent email place that these things can live uh, as an archive. But past that, uh, we have to consider how we syndicate and, and, and broadly get the message out. Right now we have a Stan maintains a blast list of about, I forget, seven or 800 people who somewhere in the past have been associated with Tadwig, which is pretty good. I mean, it, it hits a lot of different people, but it does not hit sort of community people outside of us who may be very concerned, like Brian or Jean was, was saying, about impacts to them as end users. And so I wonder uh, whether we have to think about syndication and how we get the word out, whether we just have to do more or whether there's some other way. Yeah, there are a couple of different kinds of groups of such people. The Bryans and the Genes are in groups of people who are publishing data now. And like you said, that they, they need to know if something's going to affect them and to be able to say so. And so maybe if it's feasible to do so, the GBIF registry gets us access to people who are the contacts for data being published, if that's a feasible way to go. Uh, and then there's another group that we tried to reach through the biodiversity information training curriculum, which is a Facebook group with over 8,000 members. And so that's a broad uh, advertisement and in a different group. There's people who are working, uh, a lot of students, a lot of researchers, maybe people who aren't publishing data or not publishing it yet, but are certainly consumers and are certainly gonna be affected one way or another by changes that happen. So that's another good one that would be useful to blast. I think we did in this case, I asked the town to make an announcement there, Town Peterson. No, that's good. <laughs> just for a little side note, our Facebook page, uh, we started just a little while ago, is taking off, it, it's, uh, it's adding people uh, <laughs> every day. Um, just as an aside, I don't know, I don't think we even put these there uh, or whether it's even appropriate to put them there, but just as a social aside. Uh -huh. I wonder if it would, uh, does the executive have a like communications coordinator position or something like that? Because it might be worth whoever that person is or a delegate monitoring some of these communication channels and making sure that if something comes out in Twitter that it also comes out in Tadwig content or if it comes out in Tadwig contact content it goes into Slack or whatever these various things are because I think that it just if it goes out in one thing it's not necessarily going to go out in the others. We try to pay attention to that. Prabhakar is actually uh, in India is in charge of that group at the moment. So uh, communication is important. In fact, Holly is contributing to that too. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, one of the things that's interesting, Slack, you know, we all use this all the time, but we are not using Slack in this way. And I wonder if uh, Slack could be more valuable um, in the future. If we, but we of course have to invite again, it's a thing where we have to bring people in just an observation. But, but certainly the executive is interested in how we can do better at, at this indication. Hey John, uh, Paul Morris has been patient with his hand up. Paul Morris, please. A, uh, a comment from uh, the uh, event and uh, location breakout group that um, at, at a somewhat higher level, most of what we were discussing was really about a need for terms to express relationships between terms. And that's something that Steve Baskoff raised earlier in the week in at least one of the other the groups that um, um, 
there's, there's a general need in Tadwig for guidance about how to create relationships among terms or among bags of terms. Yeah, related to that, Richard Pyle brought up um, a question of whether it might be worth talking about the idea of an evidence class for Darwin Core, which we don't have time to completely get into, but maybe I can just say this, that Darwin Core has a set of classes that are kind of broad concepts for which the fields in Darwin Core are meant to be loosely properties. So there's a taxon class that's supposed to have terms about taxonomy. There's a location class that's supposed to have terms about location, etc. And one of the classes that doesn't exist but is fundamental to how we do science in this community is a class about evidence. And though we have terms that are related to such a concept, we don't have the concept to group them under. And I know Steve's done a lot of work in modeling how evidence is super important and how to understand it as evidence in its own right would be useful. Uh, it's a, a wonderful, huge topic, but can't really address any specifics about it except to say that it's a different level of, uh, of maintenance of the standard to start thinking about these groups of concepts, these ideas and how they relate to each other. So that is sort of in keeping with, with the previous commentary about the relationships that Steve was talking about and that came from that third group. But I guess the other thing to say about that is Darwin Court and its maintenance group are open to that kind of, and that level of change as well. We just can't solve it in five minutes. Sure, we can. We just have to talk really fast. <laughs> just make a decision. It shall be so. Have anything else that needs to be answered? As we get ready to wrap up, I think I need to say, and it's in the chat now, that there's another session following this one in a half an hour after we finish, I believe, um, on species information. And then later still, want today, one on citizen science. John, may I make an addition? Absolutely. Uh, since there are quite a few people here who joined because they wanted to learn more about Tadwig and getting involved, not, and not just with the Darwin Core, but including Darwin Core. Um, it's probably worth reminding people that the actual conference is next month. And so, so plan to uh, register for the Tadwig conference the 19th through the 23rd of October, uh, because they will learn a lot more about all of this stuff by attending those sessions and panel discussions and whatnot as well. Good. I imagine, Dave, that you're going to say that all those people will be subject to an exam now that they've attended this meeting. But it was going to be a pop quiz and a total surprise, but you've just spoiled all the fun. Anticipation. Sorry. Is there anything else before we close? If not, then I'd like to, to thank all the people who helped in the making of this film. No one was harmed as far as I know, except for sleep deprivation. Um, and remember that there's a lot more to come in the Tadwig meetings this week and later on as well in October.
Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording. Okay.